happy to us this afternoon. Coach, it's all yours. Thanks, Frank. All right. Carl's probably a Michigan graduate. It's the emergency. Uh, Northwestern just upset Michigan in overtime, so uh, Carl probably got a phone call from home. But uh, the uh, first of all, uh, the way I'd like to uh, uh, sort of handle this, and I, I really would like to just run the first hour into the second hour. Frank, break me if you want to break me, however you want to do it. The two topics uh, that somehow got created was one, Northwestern philosophy, and two, trends of the 90s. I'm not sure what trends of the 90s are. And so uh, what I've chosen to do is just outline to you, uh, one, a little bit of philosophy about our program, but then two, uh, pretty much give you as much detail as you want about uh, a philosophy of our offense and how we work it and how we operate it. Because in some ways, that really is sort of the trends of the 90s are the, some of the things that we're doing. There's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of things impact, and, and when I say trends of the 90s, probably more college football, but it eventually gets down to high school football. I was a high school coach for 11 years, and so uh, uh, every weekend, I spent my weekends just like you're doing right now, just trying to find uh, hitting as many clinics as I could possibly hit and just trying to find one thing in every clinic that I could use. And what I, what I first started off um, uh, looking at programs or visiting uh, and going to clinics, I would avoid some speakers because they didn't run the offense I ran or they didn't play the defense that I was in, interested in doing. And I really found over the years I was making a mistake. And uh, what I found was no matter what the offensive system was, no matter what the defensive system was, if I could go in there and just listen, I would pick up, I would pick up one thing, no matter what the system was, that related to what I was trying to do on either offense or defense. For example, we're, we're a one-back team, but yet what I'm going to address today will be as much along the running game and the way we approach our running game at Northwestern that I brought from Colorado. And so uh, someone may be thinking that all we're going to do is talk pass patterns or all I'm going to talk about is pass patterns, throwing the ball. That, that isn't true. I, I want to just give you as much as you want uh, as you can possibly handle here today. Being a Northwestern uh, is a little bit of change for me. And, and it's really a delightful change in some ways because uh, you coach a little, little brighter kid sometimes. The last job I was in, I recall we played a, a big, big football game it was for a national championship, and uh, we lost the game. And we ended, it was the Orange Bowl. We had to stay overnight. And so uh, we were all devastated. And uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, I heard a lot of hooping and hollering out in the hallway. And so uh, I got up and went out. And there was my quarterback and our running back out in the hallway, high-fiving, and hooting and hollering. I said, man, what is going on here? I said, we just lost the biggest football games of our careers, and you guys are out here celebrating. And they said, yeah, but coach, you got to understand, we just finished putting together a jigsaw puzzle that we started in August. <laughs> and I said, August? I said, that's five months. And they said, yeah, but coach, on the box, it said four to six years. And so uh, I get an opportunity <laughs> to coach a little different athlete. And it's, it's refreshing in many ways. That's not a true story, by the way. But uh, In fact, Coach McCartney's son is getting married this afternoon. I have to leave here to go over there. And if he knew I was telling the story, he'd probably hit me with, when I walked in the door. But uh, Let me start off, too, by saying this. We start spring football April the 2nd. And we go uh, every Saturday. We'll scrimmage every Saturday. That scrimmage will start about 1 o'clock. And then we go every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday as well. Tuesday is a non-padded practice. Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday is padded practice. You're welcome anytime, any time of the day, any time of that practice to come up and uh, spend some time in our meetings. You sit right in our meetings. You do whatever you want. Because whatever we have, and if you're interested in it, uh, there aren't any secrets. We don't have any secrets. Uh, we're more than, we, we want to share them with you, and then we'd like for you to share things with us. And, uh, uh, we'll do a coaching clinic on uh, April 22nd, 23rd, and that'll be a two-day clinic. Uh, it'll, uh, uh, we thought about doing it over a course of one day, maybe run it into the evening, but uh, we found that some guys can just get away Friday nights and, and some guys can't get up on a Saturday, so we decided to keep it at two days. And again, that's going to be uh, 
Uh, our staff's going to talk. We're going to, we've got some interesting topics in this particular clinic. And I think it's $15, you get three meals, and if you can eat any better on $15, then, then uh, you ought to go there. But uh, it's, it's a, a low-key thing, and uh, we break down all of our coaches, and you can spend as much time with them as you like. You're welcome in our place anytime. We also do a camp uh, in June, a high school camp. It runs the last week in uh, June. We've had 300 students up there for the last uh, year, last two years, and it's a technique camp. It's not a recruiting camp. We don't run them in the 40s. We don't test their bench strength. We don't see how high they jump. We're there to just technique. We don't uh, condition them. It's strictly a technique improvement camp. And if you're interested in having your players involved in that, either as large groups or, or, or individually, uh, or if you have a concern about that uh, and you're interested, please please let us know. There's some flyers, I think, out there on the, uh, on the desk. When I first started, when I first uh, had an opportunity to be at Northwestern and decided to take the job, the, the first thing that everybody wanted to know was what we were going to do on offense. We had been very successful at Colorado running the uh, uh, form of the wishbone. We started off in a wishbone. And, and really it saved our jobs in 1985 and we evolved into the what became the eye bone which you may or may not know much about and uh, it was right at the end of, of that development is when I had a chance to come to Northwestern and, and everybody wanted to know what we were going to do our players wanted to know they anticipated us coming in and, and running any option well in that offense what I what I learned over the years was that you have to have a tremendous quarterback to run it uh, that is a key to running any triple option. And that is also a very difficult position to recruit to. The first year we ran a wishbone, we went through four quarterbacks. And uh, it wasn't that uh, those quarterbacks, that the offense hurt the quarterbacks. It's that they weren't specifically recruited to that offense. Uh, there was, we had four quarterbacks on the team at that time. Three of them were about 6'3", and they all ran about five flat. And they just weren't the kind of athletes that you needed to run option football with. We had one guy that was a legitimate option quarterback. And so the reason they got hurt was because they were in an offense in which they couldn't protect themselves. And so over the years, as we tried to recruit to that offense, it was very difficult to scour the country and find uh, the quarterback to run it. Because one of the things you find is that they, they, they really can't, I haven't seen very many option quarterbacks that were really worth their salt that were over six foot tall. And, uh, and so you run into a dilemma with trying to find a quarterback that can run the option and also a quarterback that can, that can throw. There aren't too many that, that do both. And, and we experienced that. The other thing we experienced at Colorado was when we were a running team uh, and we would recruit against uh, teams that were a, a lot more balanced than we were running past, that uh, we would get beat up uh, as they recruited these linemen because they were told uh, if you go to Colorado you're going to run block 90% of the time and 10% per time you're going to try to pass block you'll ne never make it in the NFL uh, and I watched all the great offensive linemen that came out of Oklahoma for years in the wishbone offenses that were drafted one and two and I, I don't know of one that's still playing or that even played with any longevity and I really believe a lot of it was that they just didn't understand or learn the uh, uh, pass protection techniques that you need in order to make it in that league. They couldn't make the adjustments even though they were great athletes. And then also, uh, when we tried to recruit a tight end to that offense, that was the most difficult thing in our offense was trying to get the tight end to football. We just couldn't get him to football in the, uh, either in the eye bone or in the wishbone. And so uh, it was di very difficult. They'd catch 10, maybe 11 passes a year uh, and the rest of the time, they were just really glorified tackles. And, and so we ran into the same thing, getting beat up at the tight end spot. Uh, we went through six years at Colorado from 1980, 18, 1985 until 1990 before we ever re recruited a wide receiver. We recruited five or six running backs, and we'd move them out to wide receiver because we couldn't talk a wide receiver into coming there and, again, uh, running vertical routes, uh, uh, you know, uh, wind sprints for uh, 60 plays a game and maybe catching uh, two, two passes a game and that would be it. And so that was a real problem for us. Uh, and so at Northwestern, the first thing I did was try to evaluate our quarterbacks. And I found it, I looked 
at what we had in the quarterback spot, and I saw the same thing that we had when we first started Colorado. I saw a bunch of guys who, who were 6'2", maybe 6'3", or 6'1", that, that really couldn't run that offense. And, uh, and so I decided to go the other way. Just prior to leaving CU, Mack had made a decision to go to the one-back offense. And so I was there long enough to research it uh, and put in what he ended up using in the, um, in the bowl game down in Miami, not the Orange Bowl, but the Blockbuster Bowl against Alabama. And so I was intrigued with it and liked it enough that once I was here for about, about a week, two weeks, I decided that was the way to go uh, with what we had and with the best, fastest way that we could make a difference in this conference was to do something that nobody else was doing. Now at that time, uh, Wacker had not uh, put in that offense, uh, run the same, and not taken the Minnesota job. And so we would appear to have been the only ones that would invo be involved in this offense. I hired the offensive coordinator who had been a good friend of mine over the years that had been running that offense for three years. Our receiver coach had been in it since the inception and really had helped develop it with uh, Dennis Erickson at San Jose State. So I had somebody who knew the ins and outs of that particular offense. And then I just had to learn it. I just had to learn it the way they did because I knew the other offense, but I didn't know this offense quite as well. And so I had some learning to do. Well, this offense, philosophically, I don't know if you can you see this? Is that big enough? OK. The first thing that we want to do in this offense is we want to spread the defense. And uh, when I say spread the defense, traditional offenses line up with uh, uh, eight people uh, between tight end and tackle. You got two wide receivers, and you got a quarterback, and then everybody else is in there. And uh, you're blocking your five offensive linemen, your tight end, and your fullback on every play. And you're blocking seven on seven people. Uh, you're trying to get seven on seven. Most defenses that you're going to see are probably playing you eight people up front. They're trying to get a mismatch there. And so uh, what this offense does in theory is it eliminates, by, by formation, eliminates two people from that box. They tried it. We try to create a matchup where there's only six people from tight end to tackle. Because we have six. We got five offensive linemen and a tight end, and they have six. Now, our five offensive linemen and a tight end spend their day blocking people. Okay? If we kept the fullback in the game, he doesn't spend the day blocking someone. And so we ask him to do something that he may spend one third of his day doing, or half of his day doing. But I got six guys that spend the entire day blocking people. And those are the guys that I'd like to rely on moving a football with. And so uh, what this offense does by formation is force the defense to spread out. In theory, it says this. If there's six in the box, run the ball. We got a hat for everybody. If there's seven in the box, throw the ball. Okay. If they're going to keep seven inside, they can't cover everybody. And so we're going to throw the ball. Now, to do that, uh, of course, at our level, we can recruit. And we can recruit quarterbacks that can throw the ball and that technique-wise and efficiency-wise can do those sort of things. I know that that isn't always possible uh, in, in high school. Some, some years you're, you've got the guy. The next year, you don't have the guy. I realize that. I think as this thing unfolds, maybe, you'll see that the concept of spreading and just the fear of the pass itself uh, might enable you to use some of this. I would, when I first started coaching high school football, we really threw the ball a lot where we were. And uh, we had a reputation for throwing the football. The very best year I had was the worst year that we threw the ball. And, but what we'd done is we had developed a reputation over the years that when someone would ask you what our offense, what you had to stop in the offense, everybody would say, you got to stop the pass against this particular team. Well, uh, we, were, we were terrible. We were less than 40% completion. We just didn't have a quarterback. But the fear that maybe he would catch on, or the fear that we at least knew how to do it, a lot, we had the best year that we ever had. We, we were in the, in the finals 
the championships of that game, that season, with less talent than we had a couple other years. But we were able to, what we were able to do is make everybody believe that we could do what we had done in the past, and in reality, we really couldn't. And our coaches did a good job of disguising it. So there may be something there in there for you. The, second, the fourth thing this thing does is it isolates your best receivers on linebackers. The guys who spend less time in their day covering pass routes and uh, especially covering guys that can run are your linebackers. You work all day with your DBs. DBs work all day backpedaling, uh, not letting their kick cushion get broke, breaking on the ball, covering the guys down the field. Well, what we do in this offense is we try to force your worst pass defenders to cover our best pass receivers. Fifth thing we do in this is that we zone block everything. We zone block everything. And when we, we you know, we will scheme occasionally game plan wise, we'll put a trap in uh, for one particular defense one year, one week, uh, and we may put a little scheme in uh, for someone else. But the way we're gonna win, the way we're gonna move the ball on the ground is zone blocking. And zone blocking, um, I'm not gonna get into a lot of the techniques of it, uh, I was real, I, I can remember sitting right where you were. Um, every year I wanted to zone block. But I had two other schemes as well as zone blocking. And, and zone blocking initially creates confusion for your offensive line. All right, that's the way I felt. And it was always easy for me to go back to the number system and count, or the veer system, where I knew I could veer block everybody and go. And so year after year, I had a zone scheme, I had a man scheme, I had a veer scheme. And I said, we're going to do all three. And uh, lo and behold, at the end of the first two weeks, we're getting ready to play our first game. Christ, we're not any good at zone blocking, but uh, I can man block and I can veer block. And so we would eventually just throw the zone scheme out and end up doing the other things because I was more confident in it. Uh, I knew who I could identify and block and I could hold somebody responsible if they missed the block. The last year, uh, I just decided, because of the influence of uh, Jim Wacker when he was at TCU, uh, before they started throwing the ball, that all we were going to do was zone block. And so I didn't give myself an out. There were no other schemes for me to teach. There was only zone blocking. And it was by far the best thing that I ever did, because I made our coaches learn it, I made our kids learn it, and that was all we did. That was all we did was zone block. And so our guys did the same thing over and over and over. We started as simply as everybody does with tight splits to give them confidence. And as the season went on, as we got better, we were able to widen the splits. But there was no question in my mind that that was the very best thing that we ever did was go to zone blocking when I was coaching high school football. And I, initially, I thought you couldn't do it. That was all college talk. It was, you know, it was when you had time to teach that stuff. But it wasn't. It was just the opposite. I was reluctant. I was the one who wouldn't make the move and uh, wished I had. I wish I'd done it much sooner. But we are a zone blocking team. Everything comes off to some form of the zone. We vertically stretch the defense. And so while we're going to spread you, the whole concept of this, this offense is to run you up the field and take you and, and, and back everybody up and create more space underneath. If uh, the whole thing starts with guys going vertical, if you don't cover them vertical, we're going to throw the ball over your head. That's the fear. The fear of four up uh, vertically, you, are, you have to contend with that on every single play with us. And we practice that play to where it's our very best route. Now, we don't throw it that much in the games, but if you better be ready for it because we're dang good at it and we have the capacity by formation, virtually every play to go four up. And so it puts a lot of stress on your secondary coach as the week unfolds. Run versus cover two. If you're going to play a two deep shell, philosophically, philosophically with this offense, you run the ball. Because there's nobody in the hole. There's nobody in the middle of the field to stop you. If you break the first line, then, then you've got big gainers. And so as we teach this offense and, and uh, with our quarterbacks and 
with our receivers, the concept we teach initially is that we're going to run versus cover two, and we're going to pass versus cover three. Now keep in mind that we're also, the number one concern is run versus six, pass versus seven. And so as we build our audible system in that I'll talk about here in a minute, the overlying number one thing the quarterback looks for is seven in the box or six in the box. That will determine whether we're going to audible to a run or whether we're going to stay with the run or we're going to audible to the pass or we're going to stay with the pass. Run versus cover two, pass versus cover three is a game plan. Okay, it's a, it's a strategy as the game unfolds. It's what we're constant communication with. When we get, uh, all of a sudden we're surprised and you're playing in cover two and we've anticipated cover three all day, then our thinking upstairs and on the sideline goes, all right, they're playing cover two, we're gonna be more run oriented. All right, uh, just the opposite. If we think you're gonna play cover two, we had a running game plan. Now all of a sudden you jump into cover three, now, we're going to exploit you with the pass. And so philosophically now, uh, uh, that's what we're trying to do with it. Always be in the right play. Uh, you know, sure, coach, I mean, uh, your wife write that up there. Um, anybody could say that. But you'll see as I, as I go on a little further what I mean by this. We always have a mirrored play in our offense in the run game. If we, for example, if we have a, uh, uh, we can call a zone play to the inside zone to the right side, we can also run that exact same play to the left side. So in our case, uh, our even numbers go to the tight end. So if we have a 32 play, which is an inside zone, we also have a 33 play. We have a 34 play, which is a, a, a little scheme play, which would go to the tight end. We also have a 35 play, which goes to the other side. And we have an outside zone to the tight end. We have an outside zone to the split end. They're mirrored. And the reason they're mirrored is so that we can go from one side to the other based on how you play me. And that then gets determined as the quarterback one walks up to the line of scrimmage. We're going to attack a, a technique, a defense that you're going to play. And we're going to always get ourselves in the right play. We always want our kids with a chance to get a hat on a hat. We won't ever run the outside zone play unless there's somebody to account for uh, the support player. And so when it says always be in the right play, that means always have a hat for a hat. We will never line up on purpose and call a play where there's a chance that someone is unblocked. Now, uh, when I was a high school coach and somebody said that to me, I, I said, how can you do that? How can you do, how can you control that? And then I would also say, we don't have to do that because my tailback's a pretty damn good player and most of the guys he's gonna play against, he can make a guy miss. And so my offense, I remember for a number of years was designed and, and we just hand the ball off and, and shoot. Uh, he may make him miss and what happened is the bad teams he made a miss, and the better teams he didn't make a miss. And so uh, as I look back, I, I didn't do everything I could to get my team the best chance they could have on every play. And then finally, philosophically, we're going to burn the blitz. And uh, because the first thing that everybody wants to do when you line up in this offense, their first reaction is, okay, well, hell, let's blitz the damn thing. And uh, that we have to take care of from day one. Now we base out of this formation, out of the trips formation. Everybody see that? Okay. We call our tight end Y, our tailback T. The, the end opposite the Y is always X. This is our, what we call an H back. This is Z, all right? Now, we call our formation, we call our formation by the tight end and the direction he's gonna go. So this formation for us would be trips left. 
We've told our tight end where to go. Our, our X receiver automatically goes opposite the tight end. Our Z has to learn where to go. Our H has to learn where to go. We also flip-flop our linemen. We have a tight tackle, a tight guard, a split guard, and a split tackle. And if we call right, right, the, the tight end, tight tackle, tight guard, go to the right, split guard, split tackle, X, go to the left. Now, why do we do that? We get into a number of blitz checks. And the quarterback will call the direction of the blitz based on X or Y. When he calls a blitz check, it calls, if he were to make an X check, it means that our split guard and our split tackle are in combination in a certain protection that's different from the tight guard and tight tackle and tight end. And so rather than making the, re the offensive linemen have to realize whether they're on the X side or the Y side, these guys know they're always, the split guard and split tackle are always on the X side. And so when the quarterback comes up and makes an X check, which I'll get into, then the split guard, split tackle know that's me. When he says X, that involves me, and I'm going to do something about it. Here's what I'm going to do. If he says Y check, he says check Y, now the tight tackle and tight guard who are always on the Y side know they have a certain thing they have to do in protection. And they don't have to stand up and say, where's the Y? Where's the X? Am I X or am I Y? So we always tie those guys in together. As a result of that concept, we also always run our even numbers to the tight end. So if we line up in a left formation, and let's start it over here. Let's go over here. So we're in trips right. This is eight, six, four, two, one, three, five, uh, excuse me, three, five, seven, and nine. Okay, so there, obviously, even numbers to your right, odd numbers to your left. If we go trips left, that just changes. Now your even numbers are always to your tight end. Your odd numbers are always to your split end. Now, initially, that is a difficult concept for your tailback and your quarterbacks. But for your offensive linemen, it's absolutely wonderful. And you must understand that Everything I try to do as, as a head coach and when I was a coordinator was approach it from the most difficult position to learn to play, and that's offensive line. And so what we have done, even though we got bright guys, we have made it as simple as we can for the five front guys, and or six, including the tight end. And so now there is a little bit of thinking you have, you have to sit through. My even number was on my right last play and next play my even number is on the left so there's a little bit of thinking that that takes place in that uh, situation now our uh, splits our offensive line splits are uh, two feet at the ta at the guards and centers two feet at the tackles and three feet at the tight ends and then we have the ability to make a nasty split, what we call a nasty split with our tight end. And our tight end will vary his split based on his blocking assignment, where the tackle's covered or whether he's uncovered, uh, and what kind of combination. Hopefully it's not something that you can pick up. But it, uh, it can, uh, uh, you know, I, we can tell a play sometimes before it ever gets started by the tight end's alignment occasionally. Now. Um, that's what we base out of. We always have the chance for four up. As I said, out of every formation, we're going to create the opportunity to take four people up the field. Our tailback's alignment is about six and a half feet from the ball. Six and a half yards, excuse me, six and a half yards from the ball. Okay, and he's in a two-point stance. Our tight ends we've put into a two-point stance. 
We played with them three-point stance the first year. We experimented last spring. This fall, we put them in a three-point stance, or excuse me, in a two-point stance. And I'll tell you the truth, there's times when that's really good, and it's times when it's a little bit of a disadvantage. But at the same time, when you're in a three-point stance, there's times when it's an advantage and times when it's a disadvantage. And we haven't, we haven't decided for sure what we're going to do this spring. We're probably going to go back and experiment. If our guys can see the blitz well enough with their hand down, then I think we're going to put our hands back down. But if we have trouble seeing the blitz, then we're going to stay in a, in a two-point stance. Uh, last spring, we didn't think there was much difference between the effectiveness in the blocking game either way. And so that's why we decided to go ahead and stay with a two-point stance and keep them up. Now, the next thing we're going to do is that we're going to take the back out of the backfield. Now, that was scary for me. First time, that I've been lining up there with four in the backfield for about uh, six years. And then all of a sudden, I don't have any in the backfield. And uh, it, it took me a while to uh, feel comfortable with that. And so when we do this, we call this emptying the backfield, or empty formation. Nothing changes in our splits. And what we do, this for us would be thunder left. Thunder left. That means there's no motion. We're just going to go out, line you up. If we wanted you to motion out, we would call trips left, and then we would call the route we wanted you to run out of the backfield, and which side we wanted you to run it to by calling Y or X. So if we wanted him to empty and run an up route, then we would go trips left, Y, go in the direction of the Y, up, and then we would call the rest of the route with an eight. Whatever we said on top of that would indicate the different combination routes that everybody would run. If we were in thunder, we would go thunder left, Y up. That told the back on the, to be on the side of the Y to take an up route. And then we would put the word Honda on, or we would put the word Yogi on, or we would put one word on there, that x-ray, zebra, that indicated a combination of routes that everybody else would run. And I'll get to all that as this thing unfolds. Can you give me one on H? Yeah, yeah. H is about four yards outside the offensive tackle. And he's a yard off the ball. He sometimes will get to five. X will align at the top of the numbers. All right, so example, uh, let me write it on here. I'm sure you know what I mean. But uh, I don't know if you guys get numbers on your side, on your field. I didn't always get numbers on my field, so I had to figure out how far that was. But the bottom of the number should be about eight yards from the boundary. Okay, top of the number should be about nine yards from the boundary. Okay, so that's, if the ball were on the hash mark, we want X, we want X on the top of the numbers. If the ball moves off the hash mark, then he moves appropriately towards the boundary. He never gets closer than five yards to the boundary. That's his rule. Z, because we had a hash mark change last year, we had to adjust his. We wanted to keep him on the old college hash, which is now the high school hash. And so he had to adjust because the new college hash went in uh, two yards. So we put him two yards outside the college hash, or in your case, right on the hash. Now that's how we that's how we started every formation, and then he would adjust appropriately outside, based on um, the ball where the ball lines on the hash. If it's off the hash, if it's a yard inside the hash, then he'd go uh, a yard outside the high school hash. Okay. The the um, T the tailback, he would have the same alignment as the X, top of the numbers. Okay, so if this is a 50 over here, he'd, he'd be right there. We'd sometimes let him sit right in the, in the numbers. Sometimes they drift a little bit wider, depending upon the route. But uh, for the most part, he's going to position himself somewhere uh, on the numbers. When we motion him out, 
then uh, the most dangerous thing here for you, for the guy going in motion, is, is to look back over his shoulder without turning towards the line of scrimmage. So you gotta practice that a little bit in technique. Is when, once you put him in motion, we just put him in motion with a heel. We, our quarterback kicks his leg way up here. We don't want any doubt. Uh, if you watch this play at all, you'll see our quarterback stick his leg way up in the air. And at first I thought this might be illegal motion, so we checked it out with the, with the officials and it wasn't. But we didn't, you know, I didn't want him down here uh, trying to fix his feet and the tailback looking to see if that's his heel going up or not. So this put him in motion. Now, now you see we've got the threat, once this occurs, not only a four up, but a five up. We also, you can see what this does to a defense in that you gotta cover everybody. Because the first thing we work on every day in practice is what we call uncover. If you don't cover him, we're gonna throw the ball. And so you gotta cover them all up. Now, you're, that's why your splits are crucial here. If you're, if you're too close with X and Z, then one guy can cover them both. So you gotta be very precise in your alignments. Uh, what we found was when you lined up in thunder, when you lined up in this formation immediately, you could see the blitz a lot faster. Everybody, uh, the defense would immediately run to where they've co been coached to get to. Uh, and one thing that you're gonna find, I'll talk about this as we unfold, is defenses can't prepare a lot of things. Uh, our guys play against this 15 days every day in the spring, and every day there's a misalignment. Every day, our guys will, on a play, misalign on a formation, and they see it every day. And so what defenses are gonna do and coordinators are gonna do is they're gonna work their ass off to make sure that everybody gets covered somehow. Okay? And, and so you're not gonna see a lot of differences. You line up and this is the first play, you know just what you can have the rest of the game. So this, if we wanna just line up in it, we can see the blitz. If you decide to blitz us, we're gonna see it immediately. And now I'll, I'll tell you what we're gonna do with that as this thing unfolds. If we run him out of the backfield, now, what we usually get when we run him out of the backfield is that we always, we, if we're gonna get it uncovered, this is where we're gonna get it. Because as everybody fights to adjust, then somebody becomes uncovered. And your guys have to be really disciplined on defense to make sure that they cover everybody. And so that's what we run into as we go through. I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna show you how we would do this from a different formation. Now this formation to us would be ace, ace left. And uh, we use this formation a lot. We use it in a run game. We use it in a pass game or five step drop. You guys probably use something very similar to it. And the split rules are exactly the same for all wide receivers, okay? H and ace is gonna line up about seven yards from, from X. So there's a seven yard split here. Nothing else changes. This is split guard, split tackle. This is tight guard, tight tackle, tight end. Now, and we have the threat of four up, as you can see all the time. Now we can run that guy out in motion. And we can run him, if we want to run him to the Y side, we would call ace left, Y hitch, Y up, uh, y, uh, or y drag, so, now he motions out to the Y side because that's the side we call. And now he runs the route you told him to run. Maybe it's a hitch route. Okay. Y hitch, and then we'd attach another word to it based on, for a combination between the other four guys. So the tailback just runs the route that you call. Y up, Y hitch, Y drag. Okay. So now, what we want to look for is how you're going to handle empty to the tight end. Then we're going to come back, and now we're going to empty it to the split end. So what would this be? This would be ace left, exit, X, hitch, X streak, X under, etc. Tells him to, to empty to the X side, run the route that we had called, and we attach another word to the other part of the route that we want run. And we, can, we, make it, we make it pretty simple. Nothing else changes. The 
quarterback now steps up to the line of scrimmage and you show blitz. If he sees blitz, he will not empty the backfield. Okay? If you're going to blitz from the split inside, then he makes an X check. He, he will either call the route, he might call 90X, 91X, 92X, or he may make a color call. He may say red X, he may say blue X, he may say green X. Those colors apply to a different receiver. So if he makes an X check, that tells the, tie, the tailback, I'm not going to empty the backfield. I'm going to protect to the X side. My split guard, my split tackle, who are always on the X side, know that they're going to squeeze in here together and protect the linebacker running through. And I've called the route for everybody else at the line of scrimmage. All right? Let me go back to the trips look for just a minute. Right here. The color's red, and any similar color to red, orange, etc., apply to this receiver. Any, anything that begins with a, with a G, green, gold, apply to the H receiver. Any color with blue or a B in it applies to this receiver. So if he doesn't want to make a number check, he can use the, a color check. So he may say green X. Green tells him to run a particular route, a hot route, tells the tailback to go to the X side, tells the X lineman to squeeze. And when we call this color, it means everybody else takes off. So that's how we get out of a bad situation, even though we may be planning on emptying the backfield. And he can use either one. He can use colors or he can use numbers. Okay? The reason to do both is because when you first start running this offense, the first thing people want to do is see if you can handle the blitz. And if you can't handle it, you're going to see it all day long. And so if every time you see the blitz, you go, 90X! But after about three, they're going to figure that out. So you got to be able to trade it off. You got to be able to use different colors. And then we always have a dummy color. We, we dummy a color each week so that you won't catch on to that. If, if we went up called green X or, or gold X every time, obviously you'd be able to pick that up too. So we try to vary. But you know, it's really difficult to time up more than one blitz. Uh, we go through the Big Ten, and everybody has one for us each week. Boston College had, had a new one. Everybody's got a new one. You just got to figure out what it is. First time they do it, and then you can coach off of it. But it's too difficult sitting on the other side of the ball to get everybody covered and bring more than one blitz. They're, they coach your ass off to get that one blitz timed up so they still get everybody covered. Okay. Now, listen, if you guys got questions, ask them. I mean, we don't have enough, a lot of us here to where uh, we got to be concerned about protocol or formality. So if there's something you want to know about, this is uh, just uh, jump up there. All right? Another way that we can empty, uh, another formation that we can empty. Now, it all ties in the same system, same uh, checks, uh, same concepts. Okay? This, this formation for us is Trey. And you can see with Trey, uh, this formation for our own defense creates a big problem. Because in order to get enough people over here to stop the run, they end up giving up a flat defender. And so, uh, and almost everybody has to make that same adjustment. If you're not using this formation, I'd, I'd tell you to explore it a little bit and see what you can do with it. Because it puts a lot of pressure on the defense. If you got the if you just got a halfway chance of getting the ball thrown. Because this guy usually gets single coverage, and he also gets soft coverage a lot. And so this for us is Trey. If we want to empty to the X side, then we just say uh, Trey right, exit hitch, Honda. And 
that's how it that's how it unfolds. If he sees blitz, then he makes an X check or a Y check. The blitz is coming from the Y side. He would make a Y check that tells these two guys to squeeze. It tells the Y to stay in. It brings, excuse me, lets the Y go out, and it brings the tail back over to protect to the Y side. And then he, he might call green Y. He may call uh, red Y. Uh, however you deem to pick your blitz up that week. If we want to exit an empty to the tight end side now, to where we have quads, yeah. Sorry, Bob, don't you sure. turn yourself in with the person out there and they're going to have to get caught? Which is probably your best athlete. Well, not really. Because it's a when we do, a, if it were a five step drop, I would agree with you. But an X check for us is a three step pass, get rid of it right now. And I should have explained that. But uh, we, we think, we had a kid this year that was five foot uh, three. And uh, he's a, he played tailback for us sometimes. But he could protect for the colors or protect for the uh, uh, 90 calls. Because our quarterback goes one, two, three, and it's all thrown. T it is impossible to get home if we're doing what we're supposed to do by releasing the ball on three steps. So it, you don't really don't get a mismatch. In fact, by the time he gets there, by the time he gets there, the ball's thrown. So, but you're right. If I ask him to sit up there and play against the best pass rushers in the Big Ten, I wouldn't have much of a chance. Do you have several well, we, we got to that this year. We'd like not to. We got to it this year because we had an injury problem and we had a big back that we could, uh, we could do that with. Our starting tailback's about five foot nine and about 175 pounds. But he, he really can stay with almost everybody in the league, but he's a good player. After that, uh, we weren't as good in the blocking position from there. Now, we, the kids that we're recruiting are bigger. The kids that we've recruited there are all six foot, six one. But we played with small backs back there for two years. And that has never been a problem for us if the quarterback get rid of the ball. Now, if he gets back three steps, dances around, then we got a problem. And uh, there's no there's no question about that, but it isn't as much as a mismatch as you as you might think. You also can design uh, the reason. If, let's say we make an X check here, and these two guys squeeze on the linebacker. We would rather have him. You see, if that linebacker runs through, then this end is a wide contained player. So he doesn't he isn't barreling down there on that quarterback quite the same way that this linebacker is. We would rather have this big guy stun this guy at the line of scrimmage and let our back take an inside out position and just run him up the field than we would have this back come in here and take that linebacker on full, full bore. That's when he gets his butt knocked off. And the biggest problem with it is these guys leap. And then when they leap, they go down at the quarterback's feet and that's when they get awfully gun shy because our back, wants, he doesn't want to stand there and take him on face to face, 240 pound linebacker, he's going to want to cut him. And when you cut him and dive over, now that's when I think you lose your quarterbacks, you lose your knees and those sort of things. So our, whichever side the protection's called, those two linemen will squeeze and ensure everything inside first, and then we'll let it come off the edge and let our back handle the pressure off the edge. And again, we're going one, two, three, and throwing the ball in one direction or the other. And this guy really only has to has to get in his way. He can't let him have an inside move. He can never get beat inside. If he gets beat inside, then we do have a problem. He's got to seal off this guy's butt as tight as he can. Coach? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to get to that, Coach, in, uh, in just a minute. I'm going to go through the whole hot series for you. I'm just trying to show you. Uh, various ways that we can empty and out of different formations. I'll get to it though, I promise you. Uh, we use this formation a lot, okay? Uh, this is a great running formation right here. It's also got the threat of four up constantly. And we, we use all sorts of motions in there with our, uh, uh, with our Z to get to this. We want to empty the backfield out of this formation, then all we have to do is make the same call. This for us would be triples. So it would be triples left, triples left, Y up, Y hitch, Y under, 
etc. And then attach the word that we want run over here. So we can run our whole offense with two tight ends in the game. We can run the empty game right there. And now, uh, if we make a, a check in here, we also can keep these two guys in if we want to and have a maximum protection. So that, that's how we get to it out of different formations. Um, let me answer that question. And go, let me go over our uh, blitz checks right now. How we handle it. Yeah. They've got to be able to run. And uh, your tight end has got to be able to run in this offense. Now, there's some, uh, there's a couple places that are running the offense in which the tight end, Washington State doesn't have a, doesn't play with a real fast tight end. But if you'll watch Miami, or uh, when Washington was running it, uh, or if you'll watch, uh, uh, Minnesota played without a tight end this year in order to get the stretch. And so, because if, you, if you're playing with a kid that's too slow to, to give you, to stretch your linebackers, then you do have a problem. He's got to be able to run a little bit. Uh, everybody else, you, you, get, you should get the stretch on. Well, let me show you how we, we ended up getting defended most of the time. Um, if you're going to play us in the reduction front, then here's what we get. We get Sam here. All right, and then they'll take this linebacker that's in here, and they'll have to move him out here. We call him a Q. All right. If he now, how many guys in the box is that? Six guys, right? You guys can't see them. Probably standing right away. One, two, three, four, five, six. What are we thinking? We're going to run the ball, all right? Because we have, we've got a hat for a hat. We got, we got everything we need right there. We, that's what we want to run the ball into. If this guy moves in to help against the run, now we count that as seven in the box, and we want to throw the ball. First thing he's done is left this guy uncovered. And so whenever anybody plays this offense, if that quarterback and this H receiver aren't damn good at just picking the ball up and throwing it there, then, then you're going to have a problem with the offense. You start the whole offense off by if they don't cover your guy, you got to give them the ball. And uh, we will go through the Big Ten, and every game, somebody will uncover him. Every game, they'll uncover somebody, and we've got to, we've got to find it. Now, we don't always do it, but... Uh, Well, if, if they play him in here, we call that uncovered. And then what happens is this guy, if this guy thinks, if H thinks he's uncovered, or X or Z think they're uncovered, they will give a signal to the quarterback. Okay? Quarterback looks out there, says, well, my H thinks he's uncovered, so my first step, if I think he is, I'm just going to give him the ball. And then, you know, that's the first thing we do in practice. Is that first step uncovered to H, first step uncovered to uh, Z, first step uncovered out to X. Now, it's harder to throw out there to X, but H and Z are the two that we find that get left uncovered most of the time. If you need to take, you want me to break in five? Okay. Okay. So, in this situation, seven guys in a box, we don't have a hat for everybody. We're not gonna, we are not going to run the ball in there. We're going to throw the football and uh, with a myriad of, of routes. Now, when you empty this guy, all right, now let's take the back out of the backfield. Now, who's going to cover him? Okay. We don't know. We don't ever know. But you're going to have to cover him one of those guys. All right, if you cover him with the corner, you see what we have out here? We have a separation here of about eight to 12 yards. And that's called a soft area. That quarterback puts him in motion. He goes out there, the corner, corner runs with him. He goes 
I can't believe it. Takes the ball back one step, and that's uncovered. We just give him the ball. All right. The linebacker runs out. Okay. When the linebacker runs out and the corner adjusts, which is what we see a lot of, okay, now we've called him on the up route, and then whatever other word we've used, the tight end's going to release vertically right there. Now you see what happens is you don't get much of a jam with a tight end. When they run that linebacker out, he is free releasing. And we release him wide. All right? Wherever the motion goes, that's where the quarterback's going to look first. He sees the tailback go out wide. They bump the linebacker out. Now, he, he, just, he doesn't even worry about that guy out there anymore now. Okay? Now my read comes back to my tight end. First step, my tight end releases. If this guy doesn't run to cover him, I just give him the ball right now. Because he, he's taught to arc release, get away from the Mike linebacker, and get up the field. So his read, Sam linebacker covers uh, my back. Tight end's next. One, is he uncovered? Ah, they're getting over there to cover him. Now he drifts back, five-step drop, and we have called some sort of a route over here. Now, well, here's what happens. Watch what happens. The corner is going to, we're going to run this guy down the field. Sam's out here to take away the flat route. Mike has to turn and run with that guy. All right? If he doesn't, we're going to give him the ball. Now, you have left, this is our best receiver on our football team is H. It's Lee Gisson down there for us. Uh, next year, it'll probably be Brian Musso from Hinsdale. Okay? Now, we're going to run, let's say we call a Honda route, which for us is H choice. H choice. All right? <coughs> H runs the route. It's a choice route. He's going to run it off this linebacker. The first thing he looks for as he comes off the ball is has this linebacker run with a tight end. And if he has, you see this area right there that is wide open. So he runs up, and he runs right at this guy. Now, this is a, your linebacker, your inside linebacker, and everybody else's, which is probably a, you know, in our league, it's a 6'2", 235-pound uh, guy that runs 4'9", 5' flat. This is a kid right here that's 5'9", 5', foot nine, five foot 10, runs 4'5", 4'5", 4'6", and he, he, can, he can lose you in a phone booth. And so we tell him to run you right off him. If that Mike linebacker is vacated, you take him, push him, he's got to cover you, and now you work right back in here about seven yards, and you can see what's there. So the quarterback comes out, they covered my back, ran with my tight end, uh-oh, they're leaving that big space in there, here comes Lee, and it's just a timing throw right there. Now, I lost my mic. Verticality, we're gonna stretch it vertically. Up through the free to keep him out of, the, out of messing with our H. Running our corner off, keep you from messing with our age. Okay, that's the basic pass and our most productive pass in our offense. We call this Honda. Why up Honda? That's how simple it is. Now let's let's say the same thing. Our tight end. All of a sudden now, Q is just sitting on the inside. He's sitting on there and he is not letting that guy inside. All right, so if he can't get inside, then H makes his break outside. This receiver always runs through the outside shoulder of that strong safety or the invert player. So as that strong safety widens, as he widens to cover that Z and to keep him from threatening the free safety, he's inside. He's not about to give up that inside, so we press him, press him, and now we break it outside. So he runs that route off of that inside linebacker's technique. That linebacker's inside, then I press him. If they're lining up inside, that's where they're most afraid. If they're lining up outside, that's where they're most afraid. So pressure his alignment. If he's lined up inside, we'll bust right off the ball. We'll pressure him inside. He's going to fight like hell to keep him from getting there. And this guy's fighting like hell to keep him from getting vertical. And so you got a big hole there. It's a five-step drop. Now, what kind of pressure do you have? One, two, three, four guys rushing the passer, and I got one, two, three, four, five guys protecting four guys. I like that matchup.
like it a lot. Now, basically, that's what we're trying to do with this offense, and that's what usually happens to us. Uh, we'll, we'll cut it now, and I'm just going to slide right on into the rest of the offense when we come back. Frank, that's all right. All right, man, why don't we take about 10 minutes to come back in about 10